to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today, nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, talking about a new film in the episode today entitled Dope is Death, a new documentary from Mia Donovan, a Montreal-based filmmaker. And the movie looks at the Lincoln Detox Center, which was established in the 1970s in the Bronx in New York City. And it was established as part of a wider partnership with groups like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. And it used acupuncture as a way to minimize and uh, even eliminate the symptoms that go along with withdrawal from heroin. Of course, in the 1970s, heroin addiction was a major problem. This was certainly true in New York City. And a lot of doctors were prescribing methadone as a way to get off of heroin, or at least to minimize the symptoms of withdrawal. And groups like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords found that this was disproportionately harmful to marginalized and racialized communities. So together, they worked with an acupuncture doctor in Montreal to establish this clinic. And the clinic not only offered medical services, but it was combined with an educational program that sought to empower people to push for change in their communities. So it wasn't just a case of offering medicine, but it was also part of a larger social project to empower people. And the leaders of the Lincoln Detox were not particularly well liked by city officials in New York. And the FBI was also not a particular fan of this organization in part because they were pushing leftist ideology, Marxist ideology as part of their classes. And this did raise the ire of a lot of political and law enforcement officials. So what we end up seeing in the history of the Lincoln detox is several members end up do going to jail. The leader of the organization, Matulu Shakur, He is eventually convicted in the robbery of a Brinks truck and is currently in jail. Most other people who were part of this group who were convicted on a variety of things are out of jail and are featured in this documentary. Matula Shakur is not out of jail and is not featured in the documentary. Well, you see him, but he wasn't interviewed specifically for the documentary. So it's a powerful story of community activism and alternative medicine, providing agency to people. And it really does get into the intersection of medicine, economics, race, and social issues that all sort of come together in this really powerful story. And the film is told through the words of the people who lived it. There's no central narrator to it, which I really did enjoy. As I watched it, it it tells a story of a a tough time in a lot of people's lives. And the struggle is very real in the film and it comes across really effectively. So that film is available currently through Hot Docs. Again, the title is Dope is Death. And that is the subject of the episode today. And I was lucky enough to get to talk to Mia Donovan. So without any further ado, here is that conversation. So Mia Donovan joining us from Montreal. Mia, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to talking to you uh, about the film. Again, Dope is Death, uh, which I watched over the weekend as, as we're talking here. And I, I just want to start by mentioning, you know, you're in Montreal. You're a Montreal-based filmmaker. The story is centered in New York City. There are elements from Montreal involved in the story, but it's primarily a a New York story. So how did you as a Montreal based filmmaker get involved in this particular story? About eight years ago, I met Mario Wexu, who was the acupuncture teacher who took um, 
Matula Shakur and a few of the Black Panthers and the Young Lords under his wing and taught them acupuncture here in Montreal at the school that his father ran. And the school was in French, but Mario spoke English, so he, him and his father believed so much in what they were trying to do to help people get off drugs in the community that they, um, Mario taught the, them acupuncture in English. So when I met Mario and he started telling me about the story, I was just really intrigued to know more and quite um, impressed that I, and blown away that I'd never heard about this. So I started to write Matulu Shakur, who's been in prison since 1986, and corresponding with him. And I started visiting him and then reaching out to as many people who were involved in this program as possible that are still around in New York. And then from there, he decided to make this documentary. So that part of the process, I'm very fascinated by that your your part of reaching out and working with these individuals who are on camera and those, of course, who, who aren't on camera as well. But this is a story that I'm, I'm wondering how you got to the point where they trusted you and they welcomed you in and, and put you in a position to tell this story, because I can imagine for some of them the way in which they were treated by you know police government officials that they would be rightfully cautious about sharing their story and sharing of themselves with somebody because they would want to ensure that it is done in a way that is you know respectful to them and is respectful to the events that took place so what was that process for you in earning the trust of this community to tell that story yeah i mean first of all i'm just so grateful all the time that i was able to earn the trust to do the story um i'm not sure exactly what the turning point or what um exactly you know earned it from matulu because it was through him uh, he's the one that opened the door to my access to everyone um but in 2013, I was working on a different film that brought me to San Diego and L.A. quite often. It was a film I did on um, Ted Patrick, a, a deprogrammer. So I was going out there two or three times a year, and that's when I started to visit Matulu, who's in a prison a couple hours east of L.A. So I wasn't sure really when I first started meeting him what I was going to do what kind of project I was going to take on. I thought um, originally I thought there was, it was going to be more centered around Mario Wexu here in Montreal and his relationship to his own struggles with drug addiction. But as projects evolve and relationships change and, you know, Mario wasn't as interested in participating in the original film idea I had and, then the more I became more and more invested emotionally with Matulu's story and who he was. And, you know, I asked him a couple, like maybe by 2015, I think a couple years after I had already started visiting him, if I told him I would love to do this, a documentary about the Lincoln detox and he was really open to it. And then he started putting me in touch with people. So I think because he reached out to, not everyone, but most people that he could reach out to, like Walter Bosque, his family, like McKinney Shakur, certain people that he put me in direct contact with. And also his son helped out a lot, Mokrim Shakur, although he's not in the film, he helped to kind of um, work as his father's eyes and ears outside of prison. So Mokrim checked out my previous films, met me in person a lot. And, you know, so it was this process of getting to know him and the family and then going to New York regularly meeting people for coffee and then eventually you know returning to interview them right so it's clear that yeah it's not an overnight thing where you can say hey I'm doing this will you talk to me this is this is really a, a process for you about relationship building more so than being a filmmaker at least early on I would imagine yeah, it was. And also, like, there wasn't a lot of information available 
as source material to even do the research. So it was like this whole research process. So I would talk to people on the phone and then I would learn more stuff. And then I would, people would put me in touch with other people or point me in different directions. And then I just kept doing research. And then probably I would say like 2017 is when it all sort of started to come together as like, okay, we're really making the film. Right. Um, but before that, a good three or four years of just, you know, like I, I'm sure most, a lot of people, in fact, Juan Cortez, who's one of the main characters admitted that he didn't think the film was ever going to happen because hmm. it had been like five years that I had been visiting him at his, the clinic where he does acupuncture. But, you know, there's a lot of factors. It's, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into making a film like this, like financially and access and archive research and you know um a col it required a lot of collaboration in the editing process as well right so there was a lot of back and forth with different subjects um to get feedback and everybody most people live in new york or other areas of the u.s so um things had to be spaced out a bit in terms of planning time wise and yeah, yeah. And, and especially, too, in terms of if you're going into this project and the initial idea is acupuncture is detox, and certainly that, that there is the connection then that takes you to New York, but this story is about a lot more than acupuncture as detox. Right? It's a much broader story that delves into class, race, gender, uh, sort of small p politics, uh, not just locally in New York, but sort of as a microcosm for what happens elsewhere uh, around the world. And, and being able to touch on all those topics requires a sort of a, a I don't want to say a light touch, but it, 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 it forces a, an examination of broader issues that go that, that affect people's lives in a deep and obviously personal way uh, for everyone who's involved in this movement. And one, I think that's what makes the, the film as compelling as it is, is that it's told so personally by the people who were involved in it, but two, that there's a universality to it. And I can only imagine sort of your process of thinking about the initial idea and then it grows into this much larger project. I can, I can certainly understand as you know someone who's written things that have started with one idea and ended up being you know 180 degrees different sometimes that is uh, as much a learning experience for you before you can get to the point where you're cre creating something for an audience well something matulu always emphasized with me and everyone else that was involved most people involved in this um, acupuncture collective was that they were political activists first and that everything they did was very political. So I had to really understand and represent to the audience the political context um, that inspired them or that, you know, propelled them to do this work. Like, why was acupuncture political? Why mm. was drug addiction? Why did they, how did they see drug addiction as low intensity warfare? against people of color. Like there was just all these concepts that um, had to be sort of like, there's like a kind of a cultural r ripple effect that was just really hard to like challenging to kind of get to in terms of the tone of the film, if that makes sense. No, no it definitely does. Cause again, acupuncture, your initial thought isn't, you know, war on drugs and drugs, as a form of violence against particular communities, right? The the point of the film where you start talk where it starts to talk about uh, methadone, for instance, right? Like mm -hmm. that that's a point at which the the drug itself it's being prescribed to people, but that in a, is in a way a form of violence against them. And to be able to sort of get into that and, and talk about it in a deep, meaningful way, I think that's one of the things that this film really accomplishes in a, in a really uh, effective, meaningful form. And, you know, it, it speaks to the, I guess, I guess the core of the film is drugs and the attempt to get people off of drugs. And I, I'm curious to what your thoughts are 
you know, when you first hear about this, th this is the first that I've ever heard of the idea that acupuncture can be used as a form of detox for people uh, as a way to minimize the symptoms of detox and really be an effective form of getting people off drugs. What was your reaction when you learned about acupuncture as detox? And as you learned more about it, how do you feel about it as a medical practice within the field of detoxification and, and getting people off drugs? Well, um, I can't remember exactly what I thought when I first heard about it, but I was definitely very intrigued because I've been interested in methadone maintenance and drug treatment for since I was a teenager and visited my stepbrother at a drug in-house inpatient drug rehabilitation center in Minneapolis when he was 14. And it was family week and he was there. There was a 12 step program kind of approach where there was a lot of emphasis on him, on the individual taking responsibility for their drug use. I'm sort of sidestepping your question because that's more addressing the second component of the link and detox, which is the political education right. classes. But to fast forward, my stepbrother has been on and off methadone maintenance for years, and it's just a vicious cycle. Like, it's been 30 years now. And so when I heard that acupuncture could be used effectively to treat withdrawal symptoms, I was just, I was very curious. And then the more I looked into the program and talked to people, it really, they really emphasized the the acupuncture to treat the withdrawal symptoms along with the political education, which helps to identify and unpack the, the root causes of addiction in society. This was at a time when methadone was really seen by the medical, it still is to some degree by the medical establishment as the only known treatment. It was like the only effective treatment for this chronic condition that often... Um, Drug use is still seen as a chronic condition. I mean, the whole thing was just really fascinating to me. So, and it took a while to really understand how they were. Well, first of all, they, these were really young activists involved in this. Matula Shakur was like 20 when he first started teaching acupuncture, political, sorry, when he first started teaching political education at the Lincoln Detox. And then he was 22 when he discovered acupuncture. Um, to bring to the treatment. But basically, there was just a lot of things that to me were just so fascinating and so um, um, that make a lot of sense that it's effective. Right. Why do you think that this is or this was and, and I guess even still is to an extent perceived as a threat, the idea of acupuncture as detox, because that, that gets drawn out in the film a little bit that there were people who viewed this as a threat, whether it was doctors or political leaders. Like, what is threatening to these individuals about trying to get people off of drugs in this or through this holistic form of medicine? There's a few ways of looking at that in terms of the link and detox. So there, they were operating, they were being funded by a program that was meant to dispense methadone to people as a methadone detox. And the more they discovered the benefits of acupuncture, they, the, they were originally, they were doing a 10 dog, 10 day methadone detox instead of the methadone maintenance. And then they would use acupuncture after the 10 days because people were, were, you know, really nervous about just going off drugs completely. So they would start to provide acupuncture and then more and more people were just rejecting methadone altogether. And um, I think just the confrontation with Big Pharma, this is a, a treatment that nobody can really profit from. So that, you know, that put them in direct conf confrontation with the corporate medical establishment. But I think most important was the political education classes because um, this New York Times had published articles with quotes from Chuck Schumer, who was a Brooklyn assemblyman at the time, saying that they were that it was a ripoff drug treatment program and that they were indoctrinating political radicals or domestic terrorists with um, 
with the political education classes. So there was a lot of things going on that were uh, that made the the program seem very threatening to the establishment. And I think it was mostly the political, the the nationalistic political groups that were that were there that were being represented there: the Young Lords and the Black Panthers and the Republic of New Africa. So let's talk about that a little bit. The coming together of these various groups who are at the Lincoln Detox, they're working together. And it's it's really fascinating to see these communities really lead this charge together because it's a mutually beneficial thing to get people off of drugs and to engage in some activism for the community. And I'm curious to know what, to, you know, what your thoughts are and you know, what your discussions were with some of the participants as how they saw this marriage between medical services and political activism, because it comes out in the film a little bit that these two things are inherently connected to each other, that, you know, people need access to medical care to, you know, be productive and to be active within their communities. And certainly political activism is part of that. But how did they conclude that these two things could take place under this one umbrella of the Lincoln detox? I think that they understood that in order to stay off drugs, that in order to, to be completely healthy from drugs, you had to detox spiritually, physically, and mentally. And that there was this, it was very important ideolog ideologically for for the people running this program that the Puerto Rican community, the black community of the South Bronx, um, other oppressed peoples really understood their personal history as a means of healing, as a means of like developing a strong identity and a sense of community, because there was this really valid point that addiction is a very alienating experience. And at that time and still today, a lot of, well, especially then from the people I spoke to, like Walter Bosque, who was part of the Young Lords, he talked about how growing up as a Puerto Rican, um, as a child of Puerto Rican immigrants, he went to a school where he learned nothing about his history or his people. So he felt marginalized or he felt like he didn't have a value. And so part of the inspiration for or the need for these, the Young Lords and the Black Panthers started this. And actually before the Black Panthers, it was the Nation of Islam who started this type of education as a form of treatment for addiction was to build up the person, the individual's identity and sense of community and history, which was lacking in terms yeah. of what they were learning from the dominant culture and the public education system. And that was just as important as actually, that was like hand in hand with the detox. Yeah, and it sort of makes me reflect a little bit too, just on a personal note, that, you know, I, I teach students, at, you know, here in Ottawa, and, you know, it, it gets to thinking about what am I teaching them? Or what is the narrative that I present? Because any course has a narrative voice in it through throughout that you know a spine through the course that you try to connect everything to and the more that you know i think about the things i teach the more i want to ensure that i'm adequately representing the various voices involved in the stories because too often as you mentioned and, and the individuals featured in the film discuss the voices are excluded from these broad narrative national stories and what's really interesting is to see that these individuals are using knowledge and i think it makes sense to connect it with medicine because uh, you know as, as you said as it, it it appears in the film it sort of heals the soul it, it builds people up it creates the sense of community and it gives people more agency within the stories and within the communities that that they live and that strikes me as one of these really powerful moments in the film that really kind of brings it all together. So for, for you, as you're going through and, and doing these interviews and putting it together, what was the decision like or what was the decision making process like to balance the 
acupuncture, the, the medical information that's included in the film with the political side of it, just in terms of the narrative voice that gets presented in this film? The, well, the, the editing process of this film is extremely challenging because I'm, well, I'll just, I'll say this, like there, another thing while you were speaking that I was thinking about is we also have to keep in mind that quality healthcare was not available to the people of the South Bronx at this time or to people of color at that time or today. Like there was a real right. lack of access to quality health care. So the nationalist movements like the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, they were working towards self-determination. So acupuncture provided um, a means like to to learn how to it was it was accessible um, they were looking at the model of the barefoot doctors in China, where all these farmers, where people who weren't farmers who weren't living close to hospitals in the cities, they would were being taught basic health care to provide health care services to people who otherwise didn't have access to. So they saw themselves, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords and Matulu, they sort of saw themselves as in that playing that same role. So it was really important to them also to be teaching acupuncture to others. So they had the acupuncture, Lincoln Detox Acupuncture School, once they were certified from Montreal. So I think, you know, there's just so many layers, like healthcare is just so fundamental. And they understood that. And while I was editing the film, I tried to keep everything connected to the acupuncture as much as possible. I, th I think you're absolutely right when you say two are completely interconnected. And even the points where the individuals are talking, that their words are talking exclusively about politics, it's connected to that, to the, to the medical side. That the two throughout, and it seems to me based on, on watching it, that the two are completely interconnected and it's impossible to separate them in any way one of the young lords said to me when i first one of my first interviews i did in new york um he said that you know if if a government can control the health care they can control the people and mm -hmm. for them that was uh very oppressive and they so when he was 21 and he found out about acupuncture he was so excited to be able to learn this this treatment modality it started off as a the acupuncture first started as a as a program to treat heroin addiction because this was an era, a time in New York where heroin was pandemic, like it was it was huge, and that's when the methadone maintenance program started. But then later, as they after seventy seven, when they came back from Montreal with their acupuncture degrees, then they started doing acupuncture to treat everything. Which, again, it, it sort of feeds into this idea that there's other ways to do things, too, that, that comes up. And you mentioned China and the, the connection of these individuals to China you know, that we see in the film. There's, there's images of them going to China. And I just kind of love the interconnectedness of you have this clinic in the Bronx that has training from a doctor in Montreal they have connections to Eastern medicine uh, and the, I mean, there, there's larger geopolitical issues going on with China at the time as well that, that are sort of underpinning the, that relationship. But it, it's kind of cool for me to think of it in the, again, this universality of it, that the people here who are, I don't know whether they're disaffected or, or they're certainly, they've been, know pushed aside by political leadership in New York City in the state of New York and, and in the, the federal system in the United States but they have these broader connections outside of just this clinic mm -hmm. which you know getting back to the whole thing of agency and, and creating self-determination I would think that that would give people broader connections to attach themselves to that are uplifting and uh, again, provide that agency. And is that something that any of these individuals commented on directly, just having 
connections outside of the direct community that they were in? Yeah, I mean, they really saw themselves aligning with the movements that were happening, the liberation movements that were happening all around the world. So they, um, and they were really connecting them, aligning themselves with these movements. Mitulu, I mean, this goes into, it's something that was really tricky to deal with in the film, and I didn't go into too much detail, but later on with the Brinks armored truck case, Mitulu was aligning himself as a prisoner of war and wanted to be tried under international law. So yeah, like it, it, it's very, it was the, the, the political struggles that they were aligning themselves with were, weren't just, were, were about liberation um, of oppressed people. So yeah, it's a really, um, it's a big history there. So I'm curious to talk a little bit about Matulu as well. We mentioned him mm. a, a couple of times, again, the leader of the movement uh, and sort of the, the leader within the, the clinic as well. There's there's a great line. It was it his uh, wife who says it, that Matulu, you got to slow down because if something happens to you, what happens? Like you can't do everything, and, and, which I thought really sort of summarized who this guy was based on how everyone was talking about him. But in your interactions with him, how would you describe Matulu and his overall worldview as a as an activist slash medical practitioner. He's such an amazing, warm, caring person, and he continues to really have an impact on people, young generations of people from prison. Um, he describes his political uh, awakening or his po political the roots of his political work with healthcare through his own experience growing up in Baltimore and then in Queens, New York with his mom who was blind. So he helped his mother navigate the welfare system and um, navigate getting healthcare. And at an early age, he recognized that he, he says he recognized, he remembers recognizing that, noticing that they were being treated differently because they were black. And this is sort of why he became so, um, you know, so dedicated to this part. Like his activism really was about, was motivated by like the, taking care of people's health care. There's a straight line that I can I can make there between the health care and, and activism. But what is it about him and his personality that mm. draws them, that drew people to him? Because you can even see it. This is, you know, 40 years later, the people who are speaking about him, who worked with him, you can see in their eyes and you hear in their voices just the admiration that they have for him. So what is it about his personality that seems to, to attract people towards him? I mean, it sounds like cliche to say this, but it's like he's just so charismatic and he's very, very caring, very attentive. He seems to really understand human behavior on this really interesting level. When I first met him, I was like pretty nervous about going to this maximum security prison and meeting this guy I had written a few letters, I had corresponded to with letters for a few years. And the minute I met him, it was just like, I felt like I knew him. Um, like he was just very warm and he's just, it's really hard to put into words, but he's, just to, I can understand why he, in how that I can under, I could see how he could inspire people because he's just a very genuinely caring, attentive person. Right, it's one of the things that uh, you hear about anybody who ascends to positions of leadership and influence, that sort of when they enter the room. It doesn't matter who else is in the room, but all eyes are going to be on them, right? Is he the, sort of that sort of guy who sort of commands the attention of a space? And and I don't mean that in even like a like you know, sort of power way, but just the charisma of him. The the you know people are just drawn to him and just sort of soaks up all the oxygen in a room. Yeah, and he's also just so aware, and he's so good at reading people. I think it's just very easy for him to relate to anyone. Like he's a very present person. Um, he's just a very, he's somebody who tends, 
everybody's sort of this came up a lot when people were talking about him, but he's always trying to find solutions to problems. So even having casual conversations with him, he's just always like, it's like he's always wants to just help everybody out of whatever situation. Like he's just, I don't know. I mean, so it's not surprising that he came up with these solutions to help people that he, he also like one quote that is not in the film, but that I heard him say on a radio show from the early nineties. He said that, this is speaking from Matulu. He said, back in 19, in the late 60s, we had the pleasure of feeling like we were going to be free by 1973. So I think that sort of sums up, like he had so much hope and for the movement that it just really propelled him to move forward and get, you know, get people involved in, uh, in, in making changes. Like he really saw like freedom just around the corner. And, and that yeah, kind no. of faith is super infectious, you know, and motivating. And he still has that even today. And, and you're right. That That is what people want, right? Especially when, yeah. when, especially in situations that he was working in where people are addicted to drugs, they're, they're in poverty. Hope is in short supply in these communities. And that is made clear in the film, too, that some of the people who were patients in receiving the acupuncture openly talked that this was the first time in their lives or the first time in a long time that they felt hopeful. And that is a really powerful force in people's lives. Yeah. I mean, people would go to the Lincoln detox, they would receive acupuncture. They would attend these political education classes and then they would get, you know, they would get inspired that and um, empowered that they could, take control of their own destiny and make a change in their community. So he mobilized a lot of people. They went out, they protest, they fought for their rights. And then the government or the FBI started surveying them, the CIA, because they saw this as a potential threat. You know, the, the counterintelligence program was designed to pacify and disrupt organizations like the Black Panthers and um, the Young Lords. And this was, in a way, an extension of that mobility so in that context, do you think that this story is or that there is any justice within this story? Because, we, you know, Matulu's there. He's doing this work. There's so many people in this film who talk about how their lives were improved by this program. But then, you know, you mentioned the Brinks truck. Uh, you know, the, the counterintelligence, FBI, CIA, and just the general resistance that these individuals faced from city officials and, and certainly higher up. Is this possibly a story of justice or can there be justice in these types of situations where people are just seemingly trying to do good for the community and that runs into resistance from official political leadership yeah it's a it's a hard question to answer because it's been going on for so long but i think it's you know it's pretty remarkable if we look back and we um back to 1969 and j edgar j edgar hoover publicly saying that the black panther party was the biggest threat to the nation and the efforts that were made to criminalize these organizations that were doing so much good for the community. The Black Panthers were feeding 50,000 children breakfast every morning. So there has there is this history of criminali criminalizing nationalist black movements in favor of, you know, we have the civil rights movement and then we have these black nationalist movements that were happening at the same time and they're it's hard to deny that there was a lot of effort and there's a lot of proof to this that the counterintelligence program was interested in in controlling the narrative of these groups and making them and criminalizing them and turning the attention away from the good that they were doing in the community. So we're starting more people are learning about this, how acupuncture, where this five point ear acupuncture protocol really started and this this acupuncture protocol that they developed to treat heroin addiction is being treated, is being used globally. 
I think there's over 600 clinics that use it in the U.S. alone. Prisons have used it, are using the program. Um, after 9-11, practitioners went on site to treat volunteers of 9-11 and the firefighters, like they were applying the ear acupuncture to treat trauma on site. So this, and a lot of people don't know where this actually comes from because officially it was um, incorporated in 1985 by this man named Dr. Michael Smith, who was part of the collective. He was the white doctor working at Lincoln Hospital with these activists since the early 70s, but he incorporated it himself in 1985 and gave little, if any, credit to the activists who were part of it. It sort of speaks into or leads into something else I was going to I wanted to address that I think we we should is that obviously race is a critical element of this story that you have members of the Black Panthers. You have uh, the young lords, you have you know, the, the black community, you have uh, Hispanic community, Puerto Rican community that are coming together in this. And the resistance is largely coming from white leadership in New York City. And, you know, if we're going to talk about things like justice and uh, questions of agency, certainly race is part of that. And I I'm just curious in, in your dealing and your interaction with the people, because there are white individuals who are involved in the story and involved in the detox center. But how much did they talk about race explicitly as one of the core issues that was central to what they were doing in the detox? Yeah, I mean, they really were about um, empowering people of color. I don't know how they actually articulated it specifically, like in terms of um, white supremacy. Like, I don't know how much a lot of the literature that they were using doesn't, isn't really, doesn't exist anymore necessarily. Right. But um, there was... One, Seku Odinga described to me that um, I asked him about this once, and he said that they had their attitude at that time was more about anti imperialism and that all oppressed people were had to come together to fight the system. So, the, a lot of the white people involved in this organization that are in the film, they were in this group called the May 19th Organization. They were a group of mostly white lesbian women who were working in solidarity with the black power movement. And then there were other white people involved in this collective who or in this movement who were at the Lincoln detox and at the clinic after in Harlem called the Black Acupuncture Advisory Association of North America, who were not who said they weren't allowed to join the collective because they were white people and that the his, history historically white people tend to um, take things over and that they, they, the white people could be part of it, but they had to, they could only work in solidarity. They couldn't be an official member of the collective. That doesn't really answer the question, but I well, no, think I, I, it, it sort of addresses it, right? It and, addresses it. Yeah. Right. And sort of where their, what, where, what their perspective was. And I think the, the notion of anti-imperialism is, really interesting and you know when you talk about imperialism who are the people who impose imperial systems on others uh, and it tends to be european people of european origin and that's just mm -hmm. the way that imperialism has worked for the past at least mm -hmm. thousand years if not much longer than that so it, it doesn't have to be a case where necessarily they're explicitly saying something but when you say anti-imperialism there is or it's clear in that context sort of who the leadership is, what the goal of an organization is. And I like the idea of you know, white people are welcome. They're not going to be excluded. But the idea that they are there um, to learn about these people and learn about their stories and to provide any support that they can, I think that's a really uh, empowering message and a, an effective use of the... Lincoln Center, the Lincoln Detox, uh, the center there, to be inclusive and the idea that everybody in this community can work together to overcome these structural issues in society that 
are designed to keep everybody down and to keep everybody divided. I, I think that can be a really unifying message. And when you talk about agency, uh, I think that's core to that message. And even the uh, the, the people involved in the, the Lincoln Collective, um, there was different, you know, there was still a lot of, no, I wouldn't say there was conflict, but I mean, Cleo Silvers, who was a Black Panther, mentioned to me off camera how her and Matulu had some ideological conflicts because she was he was a black nationalist and the Republic of New Africa was working towards um, a new nation like a of um, and how she was more for uh, working together so there was a just within the collective there was a there were ideological differences but everybody worked they understood they had to work together right so it's just a really um, there was a it, it, it yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's almost like human beings have nuance and you know it's it, you can't paint a broad brush that of course there's going to be ideological differences when you get a group of people together that's just the way human beings are and that's okay too and and what's cool about the story is that we can have difference of differences of opinion but we can all still be working towards the same goal and you see that a couple times in the film too, where there there are people who have conflicting approaches or maybe different. Even sometimes the memory of things could be a little different, but ultimately the the purpose is the same, and the the differences that exist don't overshadow the commonalities and what's bringing people together. Because at the end of the day, not only this particular group of people in the film, but just human beings in general we do have more in common with each other than the differences and the differences can be overcome if we're all working towards a goal. And, and I think I certainly wouldn't want to speak for anybody who's in the film, but I would assume based on having seen it, that a lot of them would agree with that general principle that they were all working together towards a common goal, despite any differences that existed. Yeah. And they were, I don't want to sound naive, but are, they weren't naive. They understood race and in in the context of the war on drugs. And Matulu was studying COINTELPRO early on. Like in the, you know, as soon as it was made public, he was working, you know, for the defense of political prisoners. So he understood the ramifications that the war on drugs would have on people of color. And 40 years later, almost actually 35 years later, when I met him in prison, he explained to me how even how they uh, they saw what was going to happen and right. behind walls he's watched the prison population explode from like 300,000 people to over 2 million people mostly people of color so but, and mostly for l l mm -hmm. low level drug offenses too yes yes so they were really it's really remarkable how they were so aware of that from day one really of the war on drugs they really saw what this the potential of what that would mean and unfortunately it came true you know yeah yeah and certainly things like three strikes and you're out uh that policy just i guess you have th three low-level drug offenses and a life sentence in prison like those sorts of laws that were put in place within the the realm of this war on drugs it's just you're is, is harmful to very particular communities it was very targeted uh, and certainly did a lot of damage and more damage than good uh, when you're talking about if the ultimate goal is to eliminate the dependency on narcotics of people uh, certainly those sorts of policies were not well suited to do that and my last question that I have is now I, I don't want to say I'm skeptical of all things that are new in medicine because that's not a smart way to think of things but and i i don't have a lot of personal experience in terms of uh, drug dependency and withdrawal symptoms all that kind of stuff i've read about it and you know i can i can empathize but i i certainly don't understand from personal experience but is this just at, at its core acupuncture as a form of detoxification and the things that these individuals were practicing and still do practice how effective is it and is it a model that 
anyone who may not be familiar with this as a treatment for drug dependency, is this something that people should be pursuing if they're in this situation themselves? Um, yeah, I mean, like I'll say, um, again, I said this earlier, like for the Lincoln detox, it was the combination of the acupuncture to treat the physical withdrawal symptoms and the acu and sorry, and the political education sure. classes and that support go hand in hand. But I will say today, uh, or in the last few years, while I, uh, while shooting this film, I spent a lot of time at a, at a New York harm reduction clinic in, in Harlem. And I was fortunate, lucky to be able to spend some time in there and witness people coming in, experiencing some withdrawal symptoms, like looking pretty agitated and irritable and like fidgety. And they would sit down and Juan Cortez would apply the five, the five point ear acupuncture. And I would literally see different people over and over again, come in, sit down, agitate it, get the needles. And then with 10 minutes, you can see them just relax. And I've tried the ear acupuncture and there is, there is definitely something physiologically that happens, but I think you need to have the support of a community right. as well. So the same thing at Naira, which is the New York Harm Reduction Educators Clinic, you have it's a very there, it's a very non-stigmatizing environment. Like their their approach towards addiction, you can they um, there is you know there's a community there, so there is like there's a lot going on. But um, again, with the political education and the analysis of methadone, there was this incentive to there was a heightened awareness in the early 70s that methadone was being used to control and oppress people in New York City, people of color. Um, there was cases where people couldn't get their welfare check unless they were on the methadone program or it was t tied to um, their legal cases. Um, so there, you know, there was a lot of reasons to be suspicious of it, hmm. of methadone maintenance, particularly then with people from, from the people in these communities. So there was that incentive to... Um, and then I'll just say one last thing. Like this was a period that was like 1970 to 1978, and then in the 80s, crack came. So right. that was a whole other thing. So this is a very, you know, it's a small period um, of history. It was very effective, and people are still using it. I mean, I've seen this ear acupuncture protocol being used effectively. And so, yeah, I think that more people should be trying it. And, and these things are cyclical too, right? The, yeah. You know, the, the, yeah, you know, cocaine comes in and, and different forms of drugs, but you know, the, the ultimate purpose of getting people off drugs, creating community, you know, that still exists and, and sort of the cyclical nature of it. And certainly the testimonials, I don't know if you, I don't know if we would count them as testimonials, but the voices of people today who are in the clinics, who are practicing, and also those who are the patients are, are really quite powerful. And uh, again, you can see the community that is being created in those moments, in those contemporary moments in the film. And it, it is quite powerful. And just as a, a member of the audience watching, I was I was I don't know if I was happy to see it because that happy doesn't have the right connotation to it. But, you know, I was I was glad to see that there is a continuation of these programs that are really changing lives and, and benefiting these communities in, in a way that uh, is it doesn't perpetuate the dependency on any sort of uh, medication. I don't know what I think about it. When I think about all these people that I got to, got to know while making this film and when they talk about the work that they did back at that time and the work they're still doing, there's just so much love and commitment and faith and hope that basically built this, this movement and this treatment modality and, and, and I think that's what the film represents and or that's what the film presents. And I think that's what audiences will, will get out of it. So a great message of hope in the film. And uh, Mia Donovan, thank you for joining me. Before you go, uh, where can people find more information uh, about the film? Also about Matulu, you, you mentioned he's still uh, incarcerated and there's uh, a lot of information out there, out there about his case. So where can people go to get more information on the story? 
Yeah, so there's a metuluShakur.com website where there's updates, continuous updates on his case. Right now he's um, battling cancer, bone marrow cancer, and his friends and family are fighting to try and get him a compassionate release, which he should be eligible for as a senior. Um, and he, if you can't, uh, if you can help in any way, you could donate money to his legal case or write him a letter of support. And otherwise, the film Dope is Death, you can find out information on at our company's website, istillfilm.com. So available on Hot Talks through June. So definitely check it out. Uh, definitely worth watching. Uh, a wonderful film. Uh, very much enjoyed it. So Mia Donovan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So there you have it. My conversation with Mia Donovan. My thanks to her for the time. Again, the film Dope is Death, available through Hot Docs all the way through the end of June. So I definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, definitely worth your time. So that'll do it for this week's episode. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your podcast and do feel free of course to go back into the archive a lot of interesting stuff in the past few weeks last week we had janice forsyth on talking about her new book reclaiming tom longboat indigenous self-determination in canadian sport a couple weeks ago amanda bittner a few weeks ago we had hamilton as public history that was a, a fun one to get into the musical hamilton and its role as a piece of public history just a, a lot of interesting topics since we went to the weekly schedule at the middle start of March there. So do go back if you have not listened to those. I think you'll enjoy them if you liked this episode. And of course, do head over to activehistory.ca. Great material over there over the past few weeks. On Monday, a list of resources from black scholars. You know, if you're looking for material to read from black academics, to give context to what is currently going on and just broader historical material. Great resource there on Monday. A uh, real solid list of material from which you can start your work, your research, or whatever it is you're, you're looking to do. Great resource there. And also a big thanks to Christo Avilas, a editor at Active History who is leaving the editorial collective. There was a post acknowledging him on Tuesday. He's been a guest on the show talking about his book about Pierre Trudeau in the past. So uh, very much want to thank Christo for all his work over the past few years as part of the editorial collective. So that'll do it for this week. Please do feel free to email the show historyslam at gmail.com with any ideas, suggestions for stuff you want to listen to. And you can follow along with me at the Sean Graham. Somewhat sadly, I have retired at Dr. Shawnee Fever for a variety of reasons, but it's it just felt right. So it is now at the Sean Graham on Twitter. You can get in touch with me there. So we'll be back with you next week with another new episode. But until then, if you're up and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.